Welcome back, everybody, to Fly the Coop. Thank you so much for being with us today. I am with my love, Steve Wozniak. Thank you so much for being here, honey. So a question. Do you know what milk thistle is? Perhaps astragalus? What's your favorite thing about turmeric? We decided that we want to talk about in the week of Thanksgiving, the week of thanks, food. Food for who? Or what? <laughs> Don't call them what? <laughs> For, for whom? Whom? Um, for our pooches, for our dogs, mm -hmm. our two Belgian Malinois, our security system. Indeed. <laughs> yes. I'm wondering. Um, when... Wasn't, wouldn't that be turkey? It's Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Yeah, today is Thanksgiving, and uh, it's the day of thanks. And we were visiting um, a week ago about this because... Well, for a myriad of reasons, you have um, encouraged a raw diet philosophy, and that goes way back in your history, um, because you had oh, huskies, huskies mm -hmm. for 15 years. Yeah, 15 and 17. And you practice a raw diet then as well. That's where yeah, it's it worked out really well uh, for the two huskies that we had. They were purebreds, but oversized uh, dogs for the breed. So typically, they don't live that long, especially when they're extra big. Our male was 110 pounds and our female was 85 pounds. So they were large dogs and initially didn't know um, and was just buying regular kibble, you know, that sort of thing at the store. Mm -hmm. And they started having a myriad of health problems. Uh, so I started studying it, which is kind of what I always do. I need to, I start learning things when I don't know it means I'm always learning stuff. Mm -hmm. learn, learn as you grow. That's basically. what we say. That's what we say. Um, so started learning about it and switched the dogs over those dogs over to a raw diet took away all of their health problems i remember uh we did just a uh a check-in uh check checkup appointment with the dogs actually i think one of them had like pulled something uh when it was running around so anyway took both the dogs in and the vet could not believe they were 12 years old at the time the vet could not believe that they were 12 he guessed them probably you know five six um, and it's hundred percent because of the raw diet. So, and like I say, we had, you know, really, just really good results. They lived to be 15 Our our male, the extra big one lived to be 15 and our female lived to be 17 years old. That's remarkable for that large breed. That yeah. is a rarity yeah. for sure. And they weren't babied. I mean, they were dogs that were out, you know, out all over in the woods and, you know, getting in trouble all mm -hmm. over the place. So yeah. Probably get <laughs> shot whole other at. Story. Yeah. A, yeah. <laughs> um, so, but now we have our two uh, Belgian Malinois. Mm -hmm. And actually that story starts, sadly, um, we got our two dogs and uh, initially they both came from the same litter, a male and a female. Mm -hmm. And uh, we named them Maximus was our male and mm -hmm. Killian our female. Right. We had Maximus here, well, both of them uh, here for about 10 days mm -hmm. when Maximus on a leash um darted underneath uh, one of our evergreen trees here on the property we hadn't had a chance we just bought this property not that long ago so right. hadn't had a chance to really go through and do you know a lot of the cleanup around the property trim trees all that sort of thing so dog darted underneath the tree my son was had him on the leash and um came out clearly chewing something it's something in his mouth but the dog is so fast these dogs are very mouthy belgian malinois they just put their mouths on everything um, and so clearly had something in his mouth. Uh, my son tried to get it out. Dog swallowed it too quickly. My son looked under the tree to see, you know, what it may have been. And he noticed some mushrooms. Um, he told me about it and foolishly, I said, big deal. You know, my Huskies, as an example, have been up in Northern Minnesota, like all these years, and they've gotten into everything, mushrooms, you name it, they'll, you know, they've eaten it all mm -hmm. and no problems. So I never dreamed that it's possible that there would happen to be something that is really not widely known mm -mm. here, but it definitely is here. And it's uh, called the death cap mushroom. And I'm going to butcher the name of it. The scientific name is Amanita phylloides, I believe. Um, and it's not supposed to be here. No, it's an invasive species came, mm -hmm. came from Europe, they think. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely here. And we have since found quite a lot of it on our property, which means if we have a lot of it, people around us 
uh, work out in Stillwater, Minnesota. People around us certainly have it too. Um, so I didn't think much of it. And um, later that day, uh, or that, that evening, the dog ate fine. Everything seemed fine. But a little bit later, speaking of dogs, mm -hmm. one of them barking, <laughs> um, uh, later that day, uh, or that evening, uh, the dog threw up. Mm -hmm. And started to get a little worried. The next morning, the dog was just clearly not, not right. itself. Yeah. So we rushed it into the vet, um, went to what is probably the, the best uh, vet. In the uh, state. Yeah. Considered mm -hmm. to be kind of like the Mayo Clinic uh, for, for, for animals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the Oakdale Animal Hospital. And so we went there, uh, got him in right away, uh, and, and had had, at that point, we had checked with uh, people that know a lot more about uh, these particular mushrooms than we do and had a number of people, uh, experts confirming that it was indeed the death cat mushroom, which by the way, is responsible for 50% of the human, human deaths from mushroom poisoning, because mm -hmm. there's a lookalike mushroom uh, that people do pick and eat. And so you have to be careful. So please be aware yeah. of that. That's a real reality because there's a lot of mushroom um, harvesting that happens yeah. in Minnesota. Uh, and I would suspect um, there's been a lot of casualty because of this particular mushroom now that we've been through what we've well, been yeah, through. And when we were at the, at the animal hospital, uh, they told us that there had been, you know, I wouldn't say a lot, but certainly a number of dogs that had been in for the exact same problem. Um, now understand that our dogs were just puppies. Uh, we, you know, we had him, I think we got him at was it remember, July eight, eight weeks old I mm -hmm. think, or 10 weeks old when we got him I can't remember mm -hmm. and then we had him here for only about 10 days mm -hmm. so still really little puppies and um really hard on the family the entire situation because it was devastating it was devastating Steve spent over a year studying the breed and finding a breeder and then the kids and Steve went out to Michigan to get the breed and bring them back which is a whole other story and then only 10 days later it's like a newborn right so there's no sleep here um when you're bringing a new puppy into the family let alone two and then 10 days later we go through a four-day process at Oakdale Hospital and end up losing Maximus really hard really a hard thing yeah. Um, so what we learned from that, obviously we still had another dog and now we're terrified that our other pup mm -hmm. is going to get into it. So we're here, you know, we got mm -hmm. these dogs. The whole point is, you know, we have this property to have them run, to be out mm -hmm. in the woods with us, to be doing all these things. And suddenly we have to put them on lockdown, you know, or make sure they're constantly on a leash and whatnot. So it really makes everything a lot harder training, you know, all of it. Um, just being it for them to be able to enjoy themselves and for us to be able to enjoy them as we hike the property and all that sort of thing. So started researching uh, because of this process, we were researching how, you know, what could we do on our end to try and help and learned that um, there are things that you can do. This particular mushroom uh, in particular, it shuts down the liver. So as the liver shuts down, a, a body shuts down. There's no, without the liver, you're done. So um, and that's what was happening to, to our dog. And after a few days, we had to say goodbye. But um, what we learned is that, A, if a dog gets into something like that, you can absolutely get your dog to vomit right away. And had we done that, it certainly would have helped. Mm -hmm. um, and the way to do that, by the way, and that that's another part of this, like, you know, we're building, you know, we have a med kit for humans here we have you know because of all the things that we do we have mm -hmm. chainsaws we shoot we hunt all these things you know might fall out of a tree or whatever we have a, all kinds of of medical things that we've put together here to make a you know a med kit to kind of solve for any just about any problem um and now we're doing the same for our dogs mm -hmm. um so for those of you who don't know like one of the things that you certainly want to have on hand uh, just in case your dog has any type of poisoning where they need to vomit, um, a turkey baster, simple, cheap, a turkey baster and 3% hydrogen peroxide. Mm -hmm. And you want to get that into them and make them swallow it. And that will make them vomit. So had we known, we certainly could have done that right away, just preemptively. And secondly, um, there is a natural uh, plant out there that um, protects the liver. And it's great for people too. Mm -hmm. And it's milk thistle. 
So, you know, we now have milk thistle powder on hand and actually uh, proactively feed it to the dogs as part of their raw diet, mm-hmm. which just kind of leads us into that. Right. The food part of it. Yeah. The food part. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we decided um, after a few weeks, we decided we, we really did still want two dogs. So we went back to the breeder and got a second, uh, well, a third Belgian Malinois, mm-hmm. another male. Um, Which is one of the reasons we're doing this interview right now, because the entire diet diet component that Steve's built out that we'll be attaching on social, the recipe and um, Steve's working on sourcing right now um, is absolutely a recovery model. It's pretty incredible what's happened with Maximus, not Maximus, Circle. Circle. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we had, we had uh, Circle here for I guess a few months. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of late later last summer, I believe, was the first time. Mm-hmm. And had had both Circo and Killian our female outside together uh with me. And I looked away for a second. The two of them were kind of tussling. I looked away for a second and I heard what sounded like, you know, one of the dogs screaming in essence. And as I turned and looked, Circo or male was down on the concrete and just literally kind of screaming in pain. Um I didn't see what actually happened. And, and, you know, he slowly, I separated the dogs and he slowly that day started to recover within a couple of, he was a little wobbly. Um, and I thought incorrectly that he had been concussed that he would in their squabble that he must have somehow hit his head mm-hmm. on the pavement, but didn't make sense. Cause these dogs in particular are really tough. Their skulls are, hard they're all head and neck and shoulders and that's you know they're they're made you know they're they're used often in military search and rescue like these are the these are the type of dogs that they parachuted in to get bin laden seal team six they're that kind of dog used in a lot of police work um that sort of thing they're like a small smaller faster more acrobatic version of a german shepherd Mm -hmm. Uh, beautiful animals people people will often confuse them with a small shepherd Mm -hmm. um and so um so yeah, he he seemed to slowly recover and it really just seemed like he rung his bell. It mm-hmm. seemed like, you know, he, he, his bell. Yeah. he was concussed and and he slowly got better and seemed totally normal. Um, but then we had a few more incidents, some pretty, you know, relatively minor, where he would have that kind of initial reaction and he was maybe just a little wobbly, but not not as bad as the first time. And I thought, you know, is he, does he continue to hit his head? What's going on? Cause it's happening and I'm not actually seeing it until one day mm-hmm. I, they were the dogs again, they're very mouthy and we're in the woods and they like to pick up sticks and chase each other, but they're strong. So they pick up like a five foot stick or six right. foot stick, you know, something that's you know, a little long. <laughs> yeah. And then, and, but run, the, but these dogs are fast. They can mm-hmm. run over 30 miles an hour. Um, which is another reason why they're used in, the things that they're used in mm-hmm. um and they win a lot of uh, dock jumping contests and things like that too not ours mm-hmm. but the breed in general mm-hmm. um so so uh one was chasing the well killian was chasing circo circo had the stick we're in the woods you can kind of put together what happened he runs between a couple of trees and i saw it happen where he instantly stopped mm-hmm. And he dropped and he screamed, but I saw the whole thing happen. I saw his head and neck just compress. Mm-hmm. And that's when we finally realized, okay, this is, this is clearly a nerve. This is a nerve issue. Mm-hmm. Like he's pinching a nerve in his neck or something. He didn't hit it hard enough where, you know, like something would break or, or, or whatever. And, and again, you know, he kind of slowly recovered. Mm-hmm. So now we have to keep the dogs apart so they can't right. do that. Anymore. That was not the plan. No, no. We, the whole point was to have them together, train mm-hmm. together, all of this. So now we're forced to keep the dogs apart mm-hmm. and Circo recovers and, you know, slowly each time was took a little bit more time for him to recover. Um, but he recovers and he's seemingly back to full health, still keeping the dogs apart from each other. Mm-hmm. And then it was, I think last fall, it was, I think it was last fall. Um, I had Circo out by myself. Carrie Ann was at work and she, mm-hmm. she, she was on the road and she called mm-hmm. Circo. I had him off leash, you know, we have 50, over 15 acres. So he's off leash and he's probably 40, 50 yards away from me. Mm-hmm. I called to him cause he's kind of wandering a little bit too far as I grabbed the phone. And then I turned, I was just kind of looking out over our pond 
but I had already called Circo. So I'm no longer looking at him. Mm -hmm. And suddenly my legs get taken out from under me and I didn't really know what happened. And then I hear this terrible scream and it was Circo. He ran and barreled directly into my legs and just knocked, like just took my legs out from under me. But in so doing, he very much compressed his neck to the point where he dropped and was full. He couldn't get up. He was paralyzed. Mm -hmm. He couldn't get up. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, it was horrible. There's something, we knew something was up with the, with, with Circo. We knew something was amiss because he has no brakes. He just runs into things. So we knew something wasn't right, but we didn't understand what it was. And we nicknamed him crash. We nicknamed him crash. And this was, this accident was the, that was the last, that was the last of entering back into the Oakdale environment and figuring out what's really going on. Yeah. So we yeah. took him in to, again, the Oakdale animal hospital and, uh, they have, you know, all kinds of, you know, all the experts that you can imagine at a human hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, so they had neurologists there on staff and, uh, she took a look at him. So that it actually, you know, just kind of like with humans, you make a doctor's appointment, it takes time, you mm -hmm. need to get a ref you got to go in and get a, uh, like uh, to a regular doctor, and then you got to get a referral. And I mean, it's just it's a long process. So it took from that point, it took two weeks, I think from that from that last impact. Um, and it took him, it was days, you know, a number of days before he could even stand again. Mm -hmm. Um so we had to but move he, him up with us and he, he, he was carrying him around. It was, he did, you know, but he did kind of slow, like really slowly start kind of coming back. And by the time we, after two weeks, by the time we took him to the animal hospital, he could, he could walk at that point. Mm -hmm. So he was able to walk, walk in and she was able to, the neurologist was able to see him walk. And uh, she said, yeah, we need, we need to do an MRI. Mm -hmm. She said, but I have a suspicion. She's like, would it be okay? You know, like we'll do an MRI of his neck. But would it be okay if, if once we start doing that, if, if I need to, would it be able to, would it be okay if I did a second MRI of his head? Mm -hmm. I said, sure, you know, just do whatever you need to do. I mean, mm -hmm. We're there. We just wanted to figure it out. Yeah. You have mm -hmm. to sedate, you've got to sedate them to be able to do this. And these dogs in particular don't do well with sedation. So well, nobody does, <laughs> but, but these dogs in particular, yeah. it's, it's yeah. a high risk. So, um, so yeah, so she did that and we got the results back. What we learned is he broke his neck. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, and, you know, she said, this is the neuro neurologist. And she said, she's like, I can see where it's broken, but it's already set itself. She's like, there's nothing we can do surgically. It already set itself and is beginning to heal. She's like, I can see it. She's like, I don't understand how it mm -hmm. happened so quickly, but she's like, it's already starting to heal. And it's, you know, it's set properly on its own. Um, so that's the first MRI. Mm -hmm. The second MRI was revealing in that that's when we learned the why. Yeah. He was born with a birth defect. Mm -hmm. So we don't know exactly what happened, but he perhaps lost oxygen um, through, through the birthing process. Something happened though, that affected his, uh, then affected his brain development. Mm -hmm. So his brain is smaller than it's supposed to be. And his spinal stem is smaller and all of that voided space filled in with, with spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, these are dogs that are supposed to be like all head and neck. They grab something and they just rip. They're, they're made to bite and shake and. Which is what Killian is. Yeah. They're two entirely <laughs> different dogs. Yeah. Um, and even now, like Circo, even now is when he goes to shake his head, because he'll try and it's probably about as fast as I'm moving mine. Mm -hmm. Like it's not fast. He just can't do it. And he knows he's limited. He just, he tries, but he can't. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so fast forward to the, the back to food as to the, the why, why he likely healed so quickly. They're on a uh, completely raw diet. Mm -hmm. So by that, I mean, raw organic grass fed beef. They're getting venison. We do hunt deer out here. Um, maybe the occasional rabbit, uh, squirrels. Um, we raise chickens, turkeys. It's all, you know, non-corn, non-soy, non-GMO fed, free range. They're on fresh grass every day. Uh, chickens and turkeys are eggs, same thing. Mm -hmm. um, they each eat two raw eggs a day. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they, they eat, I know people say, Oh, you can't give dogs chicken bones. Yeah. So like when we, when we do butcher our chickens, our meat birds, um, like we have almost no waste from them. Our mm-hmm. dogs eat, you know, everything except the feathers and certain portions of the innards. Um, but our dogs eat everything. They eat the chicken heads, they eat the feet, they eat mm-hmm. you know, all the organs, they eat it all. Like none of that goes to waste. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, along with that, so that's already a very anti-inflammatory diet for a dog. Um, and normal for any dog, wild or not. Yeah. That's the normal. Yeah. And a lot of people forget that, but that's the truth. But the reason why that and um, the reason why that that circle probably healed so quickly is because what I feed them is highly, highly anti-inflammatory. Mm-hmm. Um, and that includes, and it's it's ever forever changing. I'm continuing to add things and people probably think I'm crazy <laughs> for doing this. But, but it works. Uh, yeah. So we'll mix all this together in batches. So it just, it makes it easier. I can, I can put it all together for you know, my daughter might help me or something, put it all together for like a month's worth of feedings. So it's not bad, it takes 30, 40 minutes to do this for a month. And then we can just throw it in with the food each day. So it makes it quick, mm-hmm. but included in it. And all of these are highly anti-inflammatory. And like I say, I'm still adding other things as well. I had to, I had to write it down because I can't remember all these. Mm-hmm. Um, astragalus root powder, mm-hmm. cat's claw powder, Ceylon cinnamon, ginger, this is all organic. Everything you know that we buy is organic, non-GMO. Um, bone meal, which is not necessarily highly anti-inflammatory, but again, great for bones, mm-hmm. bone growth, bone health. Um, turmeric, highly anti-inflammatory. We eat turmeric. In fact, I just had some eggs earlier, and I mm-hmm. put copious amounts of turmeric on my food. This is uh, all you can all eat. This. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, yep. it's, it's all. It's all people food. It's all people food. Um, <laughs> Japanese knotweed, which we just found out from uh, an herbalist, uh, a master gardener mm-hmm. uh, that working works with us, us that, we, that we actually have it on our property. She found it. Um, Chinese skull cap powder. This is an interesting one. Um, willow bark. Yeah, willow bark, and that's it's that's more. It, it is anti-inflammatory, but it's also you know helping to eliminate some of the pain. A lot of people don't know this, but aspirin. Um, was derived from willow bark before mm-hmm. big pharma took over and made their own chemical process of it. But yeah, you can actually like chew. And I have uh, a number of times, like, you know, grab some willow bark off of a tree and chew on it to alleviate pain. Um, so dried, I like with, for the dogs, I like to use dried ground up willow bark. I mm-hmm. buy it. I mean, you know, I could do it, but you can make tea out of that as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And I've done that uh, as well. Just, you know, it, it like, any pain relief if mm-hmm. I pull something or whatever, it's great. It's great. Um, dried elderberries. And we're actually going to create our own little, uh, call it an elderberry orchard here mm-hmm. over the next few years. Um, we'll talk about that at some elderberries point. Elderberries are very powerful, powerful ingredient uh, yeah. for anybody. That's great. Mm-hmm. And then um, just for, for additional minerals that you can't really otherwise get, uh, kelp powder. And in particular, I like the Icelandic kelp powder just mm-hmm. because I feel like their waters are probably a little cleaner sure. than what you're going to get like off the coast of the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's, and, and uh, proactively, uh, just throw a couple other things in there, proactively um, uh, adding in uh, milk thistle mm-hmm. during mushroom season uh, so that they're always already having, getting that in yeah, their so, system. So it's already protecting their liver for any anything that they may uh, run across. And then interestingly, our dogs were starting to get a bunch of ticks on them this in this the fall, fall, like when um, it's cold already. And there's ticks out there. Yeah, I know ticks. it's a big problem everywhere right now. They we were just talking yeah, the, about we it. We don't really have ticks, tick issues in the summer, but in this early spring, mm-hmm. um, still snow on the ground, there's ticks. And then and yeah, now this, all this of a sudden, the first now. time I've seen them on the dogs in the fall. So anyway, that's probably that's normal. A new I, just, thing. Yeah, I just hadn't seen it before. Um, but yeah, so that helps. Uh, I never finished that stragglers root, the tincture, um, which is also great for strep throat, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, some studies have shown it's like one of the best remedies for strep throat. So it doesn't taste that bad. You no, put, it a, put a dropper full of it into uh, a glass of water and drink it. Mm-hmm. It's great. Um, so, but I add that to the dog food as well. And that um, is for, uh, to, to help prevent Lyme disease because we do have so many ticks here and a lot of deer ticks versus having to 
uh, as I'm looking over here at Carter, <laughs> who, who had, had got bit by a tick and had to go in and get the 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 uh, antibiotics uh, for that. Um, a lot of people I know have had tick issues. In fact, our herbalist, Stephanie, ended up with Lyme's disease this yeah. past year. And proactively, if you are an outdoorsman, you could even be in the city. Um, that's just a proactive thing to do as part of your regime because it will limit, eliminate. Well, there are there are studies that show that the like doxycycline is like one of the antibiotics that has a lot of other negative effects on the body. Any antibiotics is harmful to your body. You got to remember that, especially uh, your liver. It's yeah, it's hard on everything. So um, hard on the gut, hard on everything. But um, uh, circling back to this herbal list, which we're going to put a recipe together on the website, we believe, and they can't prove it, but we believe the collect the combination of the raw diet paired with all these um, herbs are absolutely the reason we saw a recovery in circle. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's kind of common sense, commonly known that, you know, inflammation, if you do injure yourself, inflammation is kind of what slows down the process of healing. Um, it's also designed to protect us, of course, you know, kind of make something immobile, whatnot, sort of like a human version of a, you know, some sort of a protecting cast right. of sorts. But you're also, your body's not really kind of progressing to the healing stage. You heal a lot faster mm -hmm. if you can get the inflammation down. Um, and inflammation in general is kind of the root of all health problems. All things. That, 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 yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So this highly anti-inflammatory uh, regime, um, including the raw food diet, um, lots of organ meat for the dogs and mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, yeah, that's that pretty much has to be the reason why he healed so quickly, mm -hmm. kept recovering so quickly on his own, such that even his neck could begin to fuse and heal um, on its That's own right. so fast. Um, when even, like I said, the neurologist was, she, she, she's like, I don't understand how, but it's happened. So, so one of the things I've had clients, um, friends, uh, who've been frequenting vets and as we all know, the cost, um, to deal with animals is no different than humans, really, really expensive. <laughs> And long-term, you can have some extraordinary medical expenses as part of having pets in your family if you don't get the health component figured out. So let's say you don't live on 16 acres of land, or if you're not a hunter, how do you do this? Well, there's a lot of sources out there right now where you can obtain organic meats um, in bulk or small or as large as you want to purchase them and have those available. And you can portion off your own meal plan as a raw diet. So thoughts on that? Yeah, no, um, I've not seen, I've, I've seen, there's a number of different companies out there that will put their mix together. I mean, they don't have like all of the, the herbs that I just mentioned, but you can, get those, yeah, you can yeah. get those on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, we may end up turning this into a little side hustle business, putting all of this together. Cause it was, you know, it's a, it is a bit of a pain to try and source well, it everything. It was months of it, research. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was a lot that went into this. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so we may end up putting something together and make that available. Um, a supplement yeah. packet that goes into each meal, yeah. but then where do you get your raw meat? Let's just say you live in the city and you're in a condo and you've yeah, got so, a cute dog. So, what do so you do? I, I would personally, I would always, always, always recommend hop in your car, take your pooch for a ride and go out to your local farmer, uh, mm -hmm. find people that are Great raising idea. specifically grass fed, mm -hmm. organic, stay away from corn and soy. You are what you eat. Corn and soy are really bad for the human, for any mm -hmm. animal. It's Research all, it. yeah, it's out there. It's all GMO. Soy has a lot of estrogen. All soy products have a lot of estrogen in mm -hmm. them. Um, we're, they're just, they're not good. Um, so yeah, you want to stay even organic stuff. And I admit like we will grow organic, you know, corn and all of corn on the cob once in a while, but we don't, we don't eat it a lot no. and we don't feed it to our, to our animals. Um, oh, and that's another thing I forgot to mention with the dog's food. They also eat, uh, every day they eat some of our chicken's food. I ferment oh, yeah. so all the, all the grains. Cause that's, that is one thing. So I, I, what, what I use as a guide is what would if they were wild, right. if they were wolves, what would they eat? 
And when they do make a kill, all of these dogs immediately go for the internals, you know, the liver, they get the stomach contents, you know, they're getting all that stuff from herbivores, right? So these herbivores are eating all the grasses and plants mm -hmm. and whatnot. So the or grains or whatever, you know, whatever they can find. So the dogs are eating grains. And mm -hmm. a lot of people say grains are bad for dogs. I, I mean, Mike, to me, common sense tells me, yeah, dogs probably aren't going to eat like just dry grain like you and I might. Right. But they absolutely will eat fermented grains that's in the in the stomach contents and and whatnot of the animals that they in the wild that they would kill and eat. Um, and it is like the first thing that they go for. So, mm -hmm. um, so I mimic that and take again some of the the feed that we give our our birds. It's non-corn, non-soy, non-GMO, organic grains. Mm -hmm. And then I ferment that just in water, um, depending on how warm it is outside, three, four days uh, before I feed the chickens. Well, you could do the same thing. I, I just take a scoop of that you know, for each, you know, each of the dogs and throw it in their food. So they're eating those fermented grains as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is part of their diet as well. And certainly chickens. anyone can do that. You don't have yeah. to do it on the grand scale because Steve's um, feeding that uh, fuel, that food to the chickens that we have out on this property, but you could have just a five gallon jar. Yeah. You can, you could and, order there, like the company that we, that we order our feed from is called mile four in Minneapolis and they ship all over the country. And we'll you be could, dropping their contact information. Yeah. So you, you could, know. you could totally just order a bag of that. It's I think 23 pound bags and mm -hmm. that'll last you all year, all year. You know, how it depends. I don't know how many dogs you have, or mm -hmm. how much they eat, but which is a brilliant idea and so valuable to their diet because yeah. it's fermented. It's like, um, Oh, a probiotic. Yeah, it's loaded with probiotics. Mm -hmm. And that's why we give it to our birds and whatnot. It makes it more bioavailable, mm -hmm. digestible. Um, they get more out of it. Um, and it it uh and it, it, bulk, it bulks it up as well. So you have to get to feed them it, Exactly. So there it's a fill it I hate to say filler, but it does help um yeah, it's just fill good. them up. It's it's just good for all your arm. Uh, I I think it's interesting. Um I, I think a lot of people worry about the cost. But when you look at, I'm sure you agree, when you look at the cost analysis on what the stuff, like processed food. Think of it, think of it like, think of it this way, like buying insurance. Mm -hmm. you, why do you buy insurance? Not because you're going to be like car insurance. You right. don't buy it because you're intending to take your car out and smash it into something right. or someone. You know, you know, you have insurance because if you get into an accident, maybe you don't have the whatever, you know, in that case, it could be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay out to uh, address whatever happened. Um, well, it's kind of the same thing. And in fact, you can get pet insurance, you know, like pet health insurance, but think of this as insurance, right? You are insuring, but it's better than insurance. Cause you're, you're going to spend the money anyway, one way or another. Mm -hmm. I know so many people that are losing recently have been losing their animals, their dogs in particular to, you know, diseases and things pretty early they're not that yeah. old or even when they do get old you know the last few years are just miserable for the animal and right. the owner of the animal because they have to deal with all these problems and it's expensive it's expensive mm -hmm. every time you're taking them to the vet i mean it seems like you can every just a vet visit seems like you can drop a thousand dollars on an animal just you know like that so mm -hmm. think of it that way and now instead of spending that money to deal with the problem mm -hmm. spend the money to prevent the problem correct by feeding them what they would naturally eat in the wild. Because we are what we eat, everybody. It's a true thing. It's a true thing. And as our food supplies are adjusted and changing, um, being more mindful about what we're consuming, and that's for our, ourselves as humans and for our loving, loved on pets, um, this conversation really stems from a personal experience of watching um, what we've personally gone through and and have seen a very positive outcome, but just common sense. It's a really a common sense thing. And the reality that costs across the board uh, when it comes to food, uh, whether you go down this path or something very uh, conventional are very similar in the end. There's not much of a variable here in cost once you explore um, what's available to you going down a, a more holistic organic path. And there are, there are like, if you, if you didn't want to go to the extent that I, you know, personally would strongly again, suggest support your local farmers, mm -hmm. um, find the people that have 
you know, the organic eggs um, you from their chickens. You can go buy that. It's yeah. out there for you. I mean, the way we raise our chickens, we have a lot of money into our eggs. I know it sounds crazy, but, you know, we could probably go and buy five dozen organic eggs at the store for what it costs us uh, to do just a dozen eggs. And it's a lot of work. It's about um, their nutrition, though. The yeah, this is, this is, about, this is unbelievable. Quality. So mm-hmm. same, same thing. Like when you find a farmer, get grass fed, organic, ideally, you know, no antibiotics in these animals, mm-hmm. no shots, no vaccines all that stuff. So just the natural animal, just like, you know, like when we hunt squirrels or whatever, I mean, you know, they're just sitting here eating acorns in our our trees. So (laughs) we know that, you know, they're, they're probably not going very far. So they're pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I mean, it makes, it makes a difference, but if you're not going to do that, there are, there are a number of companies out there that do, you know, probably not organic, but have the, the meats that they freeze and ship to you. It's all mixed together with Mm -hmm. organ meat and bone meal and, all of the things except all the herbs that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, they've got their own proprietary blends of things. And and that's certainly, I mean, a lot of people, yeah, it's a lot of people do that. And that's certainly better than, you know, going and buying the kibble. I would personally, if you're going to go to the effort, I would make sure you're getting the good stuff. Yeah. Go for the good stuff. So and be- you can benefit from it too. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Cause, yeah. cause, cause and like you can buy, you could buy like half a beef or whatever and split it with some friends oh, and yeah. keep some for yourself, you know, get some nice steaks out of it, you know, that sort of thing. You could actually end up. It's a great way to go. Yeah. We have a lot of friends that are doing that now and they just love it and the quality and the flavor, everything about it is a great thing. So I want to the trifecta. I want to go back again um, three things that I think everybody should have in their pantry, um, whether it's for themselves or for the dogs, milk thistle. So let's talk about milk, milk thistle one more time. Cause we have it in powder form and how you use it. Let's revisit that one. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can, you can, however you want, you can throw it in like with smoothies or something, or you can just sprinkle it on food um, mix it up in water and drink it if you wanted to. And for but the dogs, what it does it, for the dog. Well, for, for all of us, it's, it's a liver protectant. So mm-hmm. especially for those of us who myself included, who likes to have a few beers every now and again, it's yeah. probably a good idea to be protective of the liver in general. So what a great way to do it. It's natural. It's food. There's no negative side effects. Um, so good for you. It's really good for the body. So milk thistle is definitely a Milk this is a number one. And then the astragalus, which we can put up the, um, who we get ours from, yeah, it a, comes in a tincture. In a tincture or a powder, the powder mm-hmm. I use with the dogs. And then the tincture, uh, I also will use tincture on the dogs. So I guess they get a bit of a double dose. Mm-hmm. Um, but the tincture is great uh, for us humans, especially uh, like to battle strep throat. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's Tis uh, the season, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's it's, it's just it's good. good. It's just a great thing to have in your diet, and it's super easy. You can throw it into your water, and it's just great. Yeah. It's really really fabulous. And then I think if I were to put a third on this trifecta, it's turmeric. Very powerful, especially for those of us getting older and trying to fight inflammation. Whether you're feeding it to your um, pets or you're consuming it, we love it on our eggs. Mm-hmm. We do. And our, our, uh, Turkey Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, turmeric is a powerful one. So we will uh, list this all out. Milk thistle, astragalus and turmeric are the top three favorites. Uh, we've got, I'll call it the fabulous dozen here. It's approximately a dozen different herbs. And if you want more information on that, we're happy to share that with you. I think our takeaway here is the Uh, Fuel that you feed your beautiful, loving pets absolutely can um, ensure a healthy life, a recovery if there's an injury you're dealing with or surgery, perhaps, and just a happier animal altogether, all the way around. I would agree. Mm -hmm. You you, you know, people say you are what you eat, Mm -hmm. but also you are what your animals eat. So if you're eating chickens and Mm -hmm. beef and pork and things like that. You need to pay attention to what they eat Mm -hmm. and focus focus your buying around that. Visit your local farmers. Visit your local farmers. And on that note, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We will see you next time on Fly the Coop. Happy Thanksgiving.